Hi everyone, I'm Sanda from Gibbon Madagascar. I'm part of the policy team and I will be following item 10 on the provisional agenda for COP16, which is about mechanisms for planning, monitoring, reporting and review and with a focus on the monitoring framework of the GBF. So um, let's talk about where does this monitoring framework come from? What is it and especially why is it important for us youth to follow this item at COP? So uh, the monitoring framework, uh, he, its history that is, dates back from COP15 when uh, the Conference of the Parties took uh, decision number COP15-5, which establishes the monitoring framework of the global biodiversity framework um, with its sets of indicators and also appointed an ad hoc uh, technical expert group which was uh, tasked to review uh, the monitoring framework uh, as it was at that time, uh, which I had a mandate until uh, COP16. Um, to give advice also on further operationalization of that uh, monitoring framework so that um, at COP16 uh, it's going to be adopted and it's going to know what are uh, the requirements for further work uh, that should be done to fully implement, review also the effectiveness of this monitoring framework. So what is this monitoring framework? Um, as we have uh, adopted the JBF on, uh, 20, uh, on COP15 with its sets of goals and targets, we and also with the mission uh, until uh, 2030, we need to monitor, we need to measure, we need to make sure that actions are taken to reach these goals and these targets, but also not only the actions are taken, but they are efficiently working towards reaching those goals and targets, and we need to measure how well we are in terms of you know reaching these targets, are the actions that we are doing really um, uh, pro uh, propelling us on the way to reach these 23 targets with the four goals? So that's why we need this monitoring framework. And how exactly are we going to you know know that we are indeed reaching or not? these targets and these goals, and it's through a set of indicators. So basically, the monitoring framework is a big table with all of the uh, types of indicators for each goal of the GBF and also for each target of the GBF and its element. So there are three types of indicators in this monitoring framework. Uh, for which we are going to um, talk about a little bit. Um, but first of all, what is an indicator? Um, there is various types of indicators, and indicators are useful, um, first of all, uh, so that we measure what we care about, that we are really sure that we are... Uh, doing what we need to do and it's producing the actions and, the, and the, the impacts and the effects that we are really desiring. And indicators, they arise from the values we measure, what we care about, especially um, for each stakeholders group and each community, we have our uh, own values which dictates what we are caring about. So some values um, are quantitatively measurable, while others, uh, uh, which may be equally important as the previous one, can only be felt 
um, qualitatively. So, uh, in, for example, uh, in terms of uh, quantitatively measurable values, uh, we might consider the extent of um, restored uh, ecosystems or also the, the number of species that are uh, getting out of a red, um, red zone of extinctions, for example. But also there are some stuff that is really hard to, to put a qualitative indicator. For example, um, how well do we as you feel included and uh, we feel that we are really having a meaningful participation in all of the process of decision making and also um, the, the implementation of the framework. So uh, the, the monitoring framework has been adopted, uh, uh, has been proposed, established during COP15 with these sets of indicators. There are basically three types of indicators. The first one is a headline or binary indicators, uh, which the parties will be, you know, reporting on uh, by answering uh, yes or no types of question. They should be consistently used by the parties in their national reports, and it's going to account for, to aggregate from national to global levels for a global review and stock take of how well we are advancing in reaching the goals. And afterwards, there is these component indicators, which are optionals for, or optional for party to use or not then in their national report. And together with the headline indicators, they help to cover all of the components, all of the elements of the goals and the targets, which is then more detailed. And also we have the complementary indicators, which are also optional for parties to use, and they are informing us on the, the thematic or in-depth assessment of each target or each goal. And um, Gibbon has been working on, you know, um, uh, consulting uh, amongst our community about how well we are going to make this uh, monitoring framework very youth responsive because the decisions that are taken today are going to impact our future and so uh, it means that it has to reflect the values and the things that we care about to measure how well it is um, consider how well people are doing the things according to what is important to us and uh, that's basically uh, what we, we need to know about uh, the types of indicators that we are going to see when you are opening the document about this monitoring framework so that's where you are going to see the big tables but first of all um, but also let's talk about how do the parties, how did the, the, the CBD um, chose the indicators that they are going to use um, in this monitoring framework? Because um, there is so many ways to measure one single thing. So uh, the, 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 the CBD the technical expert group and the COP used this criteria to choose among all of the proposed indicators to be um, put into the monitoring framework. So these are the criteria. First, to be considered as a valid indicator, uh, an indicator should have a, uh, the data and also the metadata that are related to them being publicly available, maybe through um, online uh, repository or official repositories from the governments or uh, from universities or UN bodies. 
Also, the methodologies that is underpinning the indicators is either published in a peer-reviewed academic journal or has gone through a scientific peer-reviewed process and has been validated for national use. The third criteria is about uh, the data sources uh, and the indicators being compiled and regularly updated with a time lag of less than five years between each update as much as possible. And also, uh, they have the, four, the fourth criteria is the existence of a mechanism to maintain the indicators uh, methodology or the, the data generation of these uh, indicators, uh, including, for example, uh, by the, the biodiversity indicator partnerships or any uh, intergovernmental uh, organization or a well-established scientific research or institution uh, to provide nationally applicable guidance on the use of indicators because, first of all, it's the parties to the CBDs that are going to use these indicators when reporting, when making their national report to the CBD. The fifth criteria is about uh, the fact that indicators need to be able to detect the trends that are relevant to the components of the goal or the targets that it is measuring. And uh, the last one is that when possible, the indicators should really align with, you know, already existing intergovernmental processes uh, under the UN, under the Sustainable Development Goals, etc. So it means that we are going to use what is really already available and ready to use, um, and that is recognized internationally. So that's the criteria that an indicator has to meet to be considered to have been considered uh, into the monitoring framework, which is quite tight, actually. Uh, so, uh, when this uh, monitoring framework has been established, the work of the SABSA before the COP meeting was about, you know, collecting all of the recommendations from the technical expert group, but also from other, uh, how to say it, um, uh, other processes under the CBD, for example, uh, the, the, the technical expert group on uh, Article 8J or other issues or items such as the uh, the access and benefit sharing uh, linked to the DSI, uh, digital sequencing information. So SABSTAT 26 really took all of these technical recommendations and uh, drafted a decision for COP16 to, um, you know, really in order to update and complete the monitoring framework uh, uh, at COP16. So. Um, yeah, apart from the monitoring framework, uh, the COP16 will also be discussing based on a document issued by the subsidiary body of implementation uh, uh, after its fourth uh, meeting. So um, it is really about uh, the enhanced multidimensional approach to planning, mo monitoring, uh, reporting, and uh, review. Uh, and at COP, based on the document issued by the SPI4, parties are going to uh, discuss uh, and adopt decisions uh, that will be about the concrete procedures for the global review of collective progress in the implementation of the, the JBF because um, the, the national reports are not, uh, they, they, there is going to be numerous uh, national reports, but we, we need to have, you know, a global uh, 
idea at the global level of how well we are doing in reaching the goals. So there has to be some procedures to have this uh, global review and to make the assessment of the collective progress that we as the whole of the parties and also all of the, 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 the other stakeholders are doing in implementing the JBF. The second thing that is going to be discussed uh, based on the SBI's um, recommendation for COP16 is the development of the modis operandi or how are we going to establish an open-ended forum for voluntary uh, country reviews under uh, that is developed under the SBI, but also um, how non-state state actors are going to report the implementation and the achievement of their own commitments and also uh, the last um, item of decision of COP16 based on the work of SBI is going to be finalizing the template uh, of the um, national reports number seven and number eight that the countries are going to use uh, for them to report how they are actually doing <laughs> in implementing their NBSAP accordingly to uh, the JBF and how well they are performing in reaching uh, the, the targets according to you know all of the um, indicators that have been agreed upon uh, after COP16. So that's basically uh, what is it about in terms of how we are going to, uh, in terms of the decisions that need to, that are going to be negotiated and discussed at COP16 regarding how we um, are going to monitor, measure, uh, uh, review and report how well we are reaching the targets uh, of the JBF. So that's it, basically. And as it is at the moment, um, there are some uh, issues and some gaps that we have identified uh, for this monitoring framework, especially relating to the youth priorities and also the values that we as youth uh, defend. First of all, um, while we have secured for uh, uh, some of the important elements for us youth to be included into the sex section C of the JBF, some key elements uh, are not well covered in the monitoring framework. Uh, say for example, it does not effectively track how the diverse value systems are represented and included across the framework. Also, there is currently no consideration for intergenerational equity, which is an important uh, element um, in measuring stability and uh, that we have really fought so hard to you know, include in this uh, framework. Also, the role of youth in the framework could and should be uh, better monitored and uh, lastly, the role of informal and formal education for biodiversity is not yet really included in this uh, framework. Uh, another major uh, gap and issue for this monitoring framework um, is for uh, target three, which is about uh, the lack of guidance for the identification and recognition of indigenous and traditional territories, which are really, um, really important uh, in uh, biodiversity conservation and sustainable uh, use. As you know, indigenous people and local communities are the best stewards of biodiversity on earth. So for 
target uh, three, which is really uh, uh, which is has has a very high ambition, you know, this uh, 30 by 30 goal. Um, it's really important that it's run from a very uh, participative and right-based approach, especially for uh, the IPLCs. Uh, also, uh, another major gap is for target 22 and 23. For target 22, Mm, which is really important to you is that the binary indicators, so basically the yes no questions to which parties need to answer to in their um, national report, the binary indicators for target 22, they address the structural changes and process, processes that are required to implement all aspects of a target, but they do not allow for tracking of the outcome of these efforts to ensure that the participation and the access to justice and information for children and youth, people with disabilities, women and girls and indigenous people in local communities. And also for target 23, the binary indicators, again, uh, it's the same issue they only may uh, address the structural changes in the process, but they don't allow us to, you know, really measure, to really track what are the outcomes of these efforts uh, in the extent to which uh, the a gender responsive approach is implemented. Uh, but nor also it is um, tracking the outcomes of the efforts for women's participation and leadership being enhanced, nor their access and equal rights to land and natural resources um, being uh, recognized. So these are the issues that we are going to watch for, for this um, monitoring framework, especially for the targets that are really important uh, to us at the moment.